Hello students, this NPTEL course is on geosynthetics and reinforced soil structures and I will take you through the different concepts of the, of the geosynthetics and the reinforced soil structures in about uh, 40 lectures in this course. So the brief outline of this um, today's lecture is I will give you some uh, basic introductory remarks, then um, historical background of the uh, geosynthetics and the reinforced soil structures and then the uh, we will learn about uh, the different types of uh, geosynthetics and their functions and their applications. So let us first uh, see what is a geosynthetic. This product it could be either a natural product or an artificial product that is used along with soil in geotechnical constructions and some of the natural materials are coir, jute, hemp and um, other similar products especially um, um, India is uh, very strong in producing uh, jute products and then the coir products and both of these they are um, employed extensively in several parts of India especially for um, erosion control applications and for um, low volume um, road reinforcement and so on and then the artificial or um, or um, manufactured uh, geosynthetics are the polymeric or metallic type. See the question may arise why geosynthetics? Well these geosynthetics they are um, recently introduced into the civil engineering field and the introduction of the geosynthetics have entirely changed the way uh, the geotechnical engineering is practiced and we can come out with very innovative solutions that um, could not have been um, done just a few years back even 20, 30 years back and we can solve very difficult problems at a very economical cost and expediently at a very reasonable speed and it enables uh, these uh, geosynthetics they enable the use of uh, local materials that is the local soil or uh, some other local aggregate and local materials and that lead to sustainable solutions and we will see how these uh, geosynthetics uh, lead to more economical and more sustainable and more faster solutions as we um, uh, progress along in this course and um, the most important factor in the, um, in the geosynthetics is we can use unskilled labor because especially for countries like India where uh, we have very large labor force uh, this is a boon because uh, the use of uh, geosynthetics does not mean that we need highly skilled labor and, uh, and the installation of the geosynthetics also does not require any heavy machinery. We can do them with very light machinery or many times just with the manual means. Well let me show you some of the, um, the typical applications um, that, uh, that could be done with uh, geosynthetics and in this slide we see the application of a coir mat now first showing the application of a natural material because the coir is uh, very widely used in India and probably India is the leading producer of coir geotextiles in the world and the top of the slide on the left hand side you see a typical um, railway embankment that is subjected to uh, severe erosion because of the rainwater flow and the gully formation and we can um, the easiest method to treat this type of thing is to promote vegetation growth and uh, the coir is a very ideal material for um, promoting the vegetation growth because uh, the coir is uh, being a natural product it degrades with time and as it is degrading it produces uh, the nutrients that are necessary for the growth of uh, vegetation and the other advantage that we have with the coir is that when there is some rainfall the coir retains the moisture and it supplies it can supply the moisture to the plants for a very long time and uh, so because of both reasons because of the provision of uh, moisture for a longer time and the nutrition the vegetation can take root very easily and in this slide at the bottom you can see the treated um, uh, slope just within about uh, two seasons after the installation of the coir um, geotextile mat uh, how beautifully the vegetation has come out. 
and here uh, we see the application of geosynthetics for um, rehabilitation of a coastline. Um, in Gujarat, in Tital Gujarat, there is very ancient temple, Swaminarayan temple and because of the, um, the extreme um, um, current, and the ocean currents and then the wave conditions, uh, the coastline has come very close to the, uh, to the temple and um, no amount of um, uh, treatment by using boulders and other forms of um, uh, treatment could stop the sea erosion. And finally, uh, the solution that was given was uh, very simple using stones, but put in the in a rope net gabion and, um, and then just simply lining the coastline and at the bottom some um, training works were given so that the beach can build up. And here the, uh, the main advantage that we gain is we are still using the same boulders, but then because they are encased inside, um, inside the rope net gabions and which are all tied up together, no amount of wave force or current force can dislodge them because all of this now the entire um, um, about um, uh, 2 300 meters uh, stretch of this um, of this structure is monolithic and um, so because of that it is very strong and very stiff and it is able to survive uh, the severe um, um, ocean environment at this place and it could uh, easily stabilize the coastline at this place and here we see in the application of a, a three dimensional uh, geosynthetic for canal lining, especially in um, uh, when the canal goes through um, sandy soil like in the desert areas and so on, the seepage losses could be very high and in that case we like to give um, a concrete lining or some other lining and uh, unfortunately uh, the concrete lining uh, will not last for very long time because of the, um, because of the shrinkage and um, other uh, problems they start cracking. And one way of uh, stabilizing the, the cement grout is by encasing it in, in uh, geo cells uh, that provide uh, the necessary reinforcement so that uh, the, the concrete does not crack. It has been successfully employed at several locations um, for um, preventing the seepage losses. And here we see an example of the construction of a, a 22 meter high retaining wall using the geosynthetics. So actually this particular application is in the city of Vijayawada. Um, there is a ghat road leading up to a temple on, on the top of a hill and um, this ghat road is, is very narrow and um, when it was constructed about uh, 50 to 60 years back, uh, there was not much traffic. Mostly the people used to walk or go on bicycles. At that time they did not need a very wide road. Now since everybody is driving cars, we need a wide road and the only way that this road can be widened is by, uh, is by uh, filling, up, um, filling up this entire um, area with soil. But then uh, this height is about 22 meters and the construction of a normal um, reinforced concrete retaining wall is not possible because the height is too much. And, uh, so the solution that is provided is by using a geosynthetics and very small modular blocks. Um, one wall is built and here on the right hand side you can see this picture, it has come out very beautifully and um, in spite of um, restricted working space, uh, this wall could be constructed. I will explain about this in a future lecture. And here you see the application of geosynthetics for the construction of a, of a landfill to contain um, highly toxic uh, jerosite waste in the city of Vishakhapatnam. Uh, this uh, length of the uh, landfill is nearly 100, uh, 200 meters and the width is uh, ranging from 100 to 150 meters. And this uh, entire um, landfill was uh, constructed using very innovative techniques. Uh, this landfill, normally the landfills are constructed below the below the ground level, but um, this being a hilly area, um, the ground could not be excavated because of the rocky strata. It has to be entirely built um, above the ground level 
and for the construction of this embankment uh, the material used was the jerosite granules um, and um, by putting in uh, some geosynthetic reinforcement uh, this jerosite um, granules which is um, otherwise a waste product could be used um, usefully uh, for construction of this embankment and um, then here on the right hand side you can see uh, the outside of this um, embankment it is about uh, this height of the embankment is uh, 10 meters to 12 meters it is it was lined with coir geotextiles so that vegetation can grow and this entire thing can blend with the surroundings and uh, here you see the construction of a breakwater unit using uh, once again um, um, geosynthetics um, this uh, technique it uses um, uh, geotextile bags filled with beach sand and these um, um, these um, uh, geotextile bags are placed inside the rope net gabions and all of them are tied up and on an experimental basis um, at IIT Madras we had taken up uh, this project on um, constructing of breakwaters and other um, coastal um, uh, treatment structures using uh, these structures and here you see an example of this um, this is about uh, one one and a half to two meters height and you can see the wave nicely breaking against uh, this structure. So these um, in the previous uh, few slides I have shown some applications of the of the geo, uh, geosynthetics and uh, all these could not have been possible just a few years back and now let us see um, the a bit more details of the reinforced soil and the and the geosynthetics. Basically the reinforced soil is nothing but soil plus reinforcement and we call it as a reinforced soil and uh, the uh, reinforcement some of the ancient reinforcement uh, products uh, that means I mean ancient means uh, some 2 to 3000 years back people have used the reinforcement but in the form of tree branches, grass reeds, straw, the roots of vegetation, bamboo, tree trunks and so on and uh, even the ancient past people built very high towers and very high tall structures using the soil plus some form of reinforcement and the modern reinforcement materials they are steel, polymeric materials and then of course the natural materials like the coir and the jute and um, the reason why we use uh, reinforcement or we need to use the reinforcement is the soil is very strong in compression. So if you are able to apply um, pure compression stress on the soil it can take any amount of compression but then unfortunately because of the Poisson's ratio of it if you apply compression in one direction there is tension in the other direction and the soil is very weak in tension and it starts failing and because of that um, the, um, the soil undergoes uh, quick failure and uh, this combined product of this uh, soil and the reinforcement it is a very good synergetic combination and uh, it has much better engineering properties than the individual uh, constituents and so it can provide very um, strong soil and very stiff soil so that we can uh, build any structures using that type of material and the concept of uh, reinforced soil is very similar to that of the reinforced uh, concrete and if you know reinforced concrete you can appreciate the reinforced soil also because it has the same things. The concrete is very strong in compression but very weak in tension and the same thing with the soil it is very strong in compression but not so strong in, in tension. So the reinforcement takes the tensile um, load when we apply them. Let us see uh, some of the historical applications of the, of the reinforced soil. So actually even before we talk about um, uh, the human beings let us see this uh, wonderful um, animal uh, it is called this beaver which is uh, very common in North America and in some parts of Europe is actually it is uh, more like a rat it is a semi aquatic rodent somehow it um, um, moves on the land but then it likes to live below the water and um, it is uh, it has been building um, um, obstructions at the dams 
across the river, across the small water bodies and it builds this uh, its uh, uh, dwelling at a very deep depth and uh, it uses the, uh, the, uh, the twigs and uh, this type of things and soil in, a, in an excellent engineering manner and it builds its nets so strong that it is not easy to, uh, to, uh, to destroy uh, um, these nests and uh, because of this beaver is, um, is thought about as the first civil engineer. We do not know how long they have been building this but uh, it is very wonderful and in many countries they issue stamps in, uh, with beaver and uh, many of the civil engineering societies they have beaver as their um, logo. And uh, there are um, several um, um, historical places with the good evidence of the application of uh, the soil reinforcement concepts in the ancient past. About uh, 3000 years back in the present day Iraq um, in Baghdad city uh, there was a very famous temple and um, it is originally um, it is thought that the original height is uh, nearly 80 meters uh, high and now it is only 40 meters high. Even 40 meters high is not, is not um, very short structure, it is very, very tall and uh, probably people have built them as a, as a place for worship because in the ancient days people were, um, um, they were worshipping nature, they like to worship moon, the sun and the natural elements like the rivers, trees and so on. So they needed an open place and um, at a very high elevation so that they can be as close to the sun as possible. And uh, this entire structure was built using uh, uh, clay bricks each of about 130 to 400 millimeters high. And uh, interestingly uh, this structure was reinforced with uh, woven mats of reed laid horizontally on a layer of sand and gravel at vertical spacing of about 0.5 to 2 meters. And the concept is very, very similar to the concept of the reinforced soil structures that we employ now. And these reeds were also used to form plated ropes approximately 100 millimeters diameter uh, to encompass the entire structure um, as an enveloping um, thing uh, to keep uh, the entire structure together. And um, so this could be thought about as one of the early applications of, uh, of the reinforced soil. And here is a close up of the same structure, uh, the ziggurat of Mesopotamia that is in uh, Baghdad. And nearer uh, to India in the China, uh, we have uh, this great wall of China that was built in uh, uh, during the 7th century BC to about uh, as recent as the 17th century. Uh, this uh, great wall of China was built to keep the Mongols out of uh, China and they had employed uh, the soil reinforcement concept for uh, constructing uh, this tall structure. And um, this is another uh, good example of the use of um, uh, reinforced soil concept in the ancient past. And here is another picture of the same um, Great Wall of China and here is another picture. And um, adobe bricks is actually they are very good examples of um, the, the use of uh, reinforced concept. And um, this is uh, mostly these bricks are mostly uh, manufactured in North Africa in the rural areas where um, um, it is traditional practice to mix some f small, small fibers um, with the bricks um, while making the, um, um, with the clay while making the brick and um, it is very interesting that similar bricks are also used by Incas and Aztecs in the Americas, in North America and South America. Recently I had been there and I had seen the evidence of these, um, this type of adobe bricks. So it is possible that at one point of time in the ancient past all the people, maybe they had uh, some form of contact with each other to exchange the technology and uh, to pass on the new materials and new construction techniques and so on. And um, in uh, rural India also is very um, common to see the use of um, bamboo mats and other things for uh, construction of these um, 
mud walls in the um, in the huts and other things. So it is another example of the application of reinforced soil um, um, for uh, human habitation and so on. Well in the past um, 100 years the geosynthetics um, have been employed is actually in the in the past the, the word uh, geosynthetic was not coined is actually the word geosynthetic came into being only in the 70s 1970s. So in the 1920s the um, in South Carolina where they have lot of uh, forests the forest access roads which are usually uh, temporary in nature and uh, they have to pass through very um, soft soil or marshy lands and uh, there they used the corduroy mats uh, for constructing uh, temporary access roads and Terzaghi himself has used uh, filter fabrics uh, for construction of filters and in Japan they used polyvinyl bags for construction of the sea walls instead of the straw bags. The straw bags used to be very common traditional materials and uh, they started using polyvinyl bags in the 1920s and 30s and of course in Netherlands which is below the sea level they have been using uh, geotextile tubes for construction of the dikes to keep the sea water away from their um, land and um, in Europe uh, they have been using uh, polymer meshes and membranes uh, to contain um, um, contain industrial um, waste and so on uh, that has been going on for almost uh, 50 60 years even before the advent of uh, the the modern uh, geosynthetic materials well the concept of um, reinforced soil or the reinforced earth is attributed to uh, one french engineer called henry vidal and i'm calling it as reinvented because this concept is not new it's actually it has been used and somehow we forgot about it and um, Henry Vidal has actually reinvented it and um, the manner of his um, invention is uh, very interesting while playing with his children on a beach um, he had to construct some um, uh, some um, um, this um, the some structures using uh, um, using sea sand and he noticed that when he put some um, small um, uh, reeds and roots and other things he was able to build much higher structure using the beach sand and uh, he suddenly he got an idea while he was playing with his children that um, we can put in more permanent materials uh, for construction of very high soil structures and he uh, did lot of um, pioneering uh, research work in his laboratory using uh, steel strips as reinforcement products and then some metallic uh, uh, sheets um, to contain the soil at the front and he took out a patent and he called it as reinforced earth and he started his own company called reinforced earth which is um, very uh, popular in uh, several countries. So this is how the reinforced soil concept has come into engineering being and it is um, extensively used in all the countries and in almost all the countries in the world. Well the basic principle of the reinforced soil is very simple when the soil is not confined if you apply some compression stress the soil will strain um, will undergo um, tensile strains in the other direction and, um, and if you put in some internal reinforcement layers because of the, uh, the tensile strength that is mobilized in the reinforcement layers um, and then the frictional force that is mobilized along the surfaces of the reinforcement layers the soil is confined and because of that the soil exhibits higher strength. So in the absence of this internal reinforcement we can uh, we need a very um, um, stiff structure on the outside of the of the reinforced soil to provide some lateral confinement and uh, here I will show you some simple example some simple uh, demonstration of the, the strength of the reinforced soil and here we have two identical soil pyramids both are made of dry sand but the left side one on is um, unreinforced and the right hand side the pyramid is reinforced and uh, let us see how they perform. Is actually the, uh, here is um, my student 
who stood on the unreinforced uh, pyramid and immediately it has failed. Oops. Yeah, here you can see the footprint of the student and so we reconstructed this unreinforced pyramid. So actually this pyramid is uh, hardly about uh, 25 centimeters high, 250 millimeters and we thought the student is too heavy. So we put only a small um, cement block but even under the weight of the small cement block the sand started moving. So this is um, the type of response that a sand um, or a soil structure can give when there is no confinement and uh, so we see that the unreinforced soil it has undergone immediate collapse even under a very small load because of the, because of the lack of uh, lateral confinement and let us see how the reinforced the structure has performed and because of the experience that we gained with the unreinforced soil on the reinforced pyramid we were very careful we started loading it very very carefully we went on putting some weights and uh, even after uh, putting lot of weights uh, there was no failure and we were uh, running out of the weights. So we thought uh, why not we asked the same student who destroyed the unreinforced uh, pyramid to stand on this reinforced pyramid with the help of two other um, 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 people he stood on it and absolutely to our amazement or um, um, it is actually not a surprise but then um, um, that is um, that is how the reinforced soil performed absolutely there was no failure there was uh, no visible um, lateral deformation because of the, the reinforcement layers. There were uh, two layers of uh, uh, geotextile reinforcement placed in this, um, in this soil and uh, there was uh, no evidence of even footprint on this, on this structure. So this small example it uh, illustrates the synergetic behavior of the reinforced soil and that can be employed for um, our own purposes. There is actually a lot of um, people have a misconception that um, the geosynthetics are nothing but geotextiles. It's actually the I will not blame them because um, originally when it started all the products are textile products and most of the applications are related to, uh, to geotextiles and um, so all the products whether um, they are geomembranes or uh, geogrids they were all bunched under. Uh, geotextiles and even the name of the international society was uh, international geotextile society when it started in the late 70s and early 80s it was called as international geotextile society but then only um, towards the late 80s and early 90s people started questioning why not we have a more generic name because we have number of products like the geotextiles, geogrids, geonets, geomembranes and so on why not we have a more uh, uh, genetic name. So the name was changed uh, the society name is changed to international geosynthetic society and, uh, and um, so the now the, um, the generic name is uh, geosynthetics we do not call them as geotextiles unless they are textile products and um, the here I have listed the website address of the international geosynthetic society and there is uh, quite a lot of useful technical information on the website and um, there is a good news for the students you can become members of the society free of cost without paying any money but you have to go through your respective um, uh, chapter um, or your uh, respective uh, country chapters. So here is um, the list of the different type of um, uh, geosynthetics actually this is the uh, these are the graphical symbols proposed by the international uh, geosynthetic society starting from geotextiles at the top the geotextiles are indicated by dashed lines and the geomembranes by a solid line and uh, the geogrid with a solid line with number of dots and uh, the gcd that is the geocomposite drain uh, is actually it is uh, with two lines and with um, hexagons um, all over and the geonet um, with the number of X marks and the GCL that is the geocomposite clay liner with, uh, uh, with the two parallel dashed lines and with um, hatches and the, and the geosynthetic erosion control mat 
it which has a crimped uh, surface like this and the geo cell that provides the three dimensional confinement uh, with the number of vertical lines and then the geo mat uh, with, uh, with a surface like this. And then more recently we have the electrokinetic geosynthetics wherein we pass some electrical current to change the properties of the soil and they are um, uh, denoted like this. These are and the product symbols are, mm, are shown on the left hand side and the graphical symbols are shown like this and um, it becomes easy when we use these symbols and then um, for identifying any product. And the letter symbols for different functions. So actually these geosynthetics are applied uh, for uh, several purposes and the, the left hand side once again the letter symbols the B stands for barrier against the fluid flow, the D drainage, drainage that is um, that um, allows uh, free flow of uh, water uh, through the geo, uh, geotextile uh, material or geosynthetic material and the E is uh, stands for surficial erosion control product, F for filtration that is filtration is we allow the water to flow but we do not allow the fine soil particles to escape. The P is a protection of uh, geo membranes or some other materials and then R is for reinforcement and S is uh, for separation. Separation means to separate out uh, the different materials um, inside, uh, inside a geotechnical uh, structure. So some uh, simple examples I will just show uh, through, some, um, um, through some sketches. Let us say that we have a highway like this and we want to widen this road. And um, if you want to maintain the same shallow slope, you need to um, to um, to uh, um, to obtain extra land and then um, move it, move the road um, uh, wider. Or other possibilities, you can make this um, shallow slope steeper by putting in some reinforcements and add extra road on the space that we gain. Okay, and the concept is like this. So we just simply make the slope as much steeper slope and, um, and then we get some extra space for our uh, construction purposes. And this type of applications are possible because of the, um, because of the geosynthetic reinforcements that we can place inside the soil and so that the soil um, even at a very steep slope it is stable. So this is um, a typical separation function in a pavement layer. The blue line is a geotextile separator and the aggregate, um, aggregate layer is separated from the subgrade soil by a geotextile uh, separator and the purpose of this separator is, um, is to prevent the intermixing of the, of the aggregate um, material with the soft soil below and uh, to prevent the piping and because of this, these two aspects, the strength of the aggregate is preserved uh, for a much longer time. And uh, the filtration function is shown here, the, because of the placement of, uh, of a geotextile which has, um, has um, some uh, specific opening, um, openings in them, it allows the water to come out um, from the ground but it does not allow the uh, the soil particles, the fine soil particles to escape from the ground and, uh, and so it prevents the piping of the some fine soil particles and because of this the subgrade can, um, can retain the strength for a very long time. Even, um, even um, if there is a lot of moisture in the ground like in the form of rain or um, the surface water and so on. And um, surface erosion protection is illustrated here wherever we have a slope and when there is a rainfall the surface soil starts getting eroded and we can um, prevent that erosion by slowing down the water and by, um, um, and by reinforcing the soil by using some surface erosion protection mats. And another major function that we have is the drainage. Drainage is uh, the um, uh, the flow of water along the along the length of the geotextile or a geo grid or a geo um, a geo product or through the thickness of a thick uh, geosynthetic product like a geo net or a geotextile 
and uh, if we do that if you are able to do that uh, the water uh, the rain water whatever enters into the pavement it can um, smoothly flow into the side drains without entering the, the subgrade because the problem with the soil is as long as the soil is dry it will have a very good strength but once it is um, mixed with water you have the problem of the pore pressure and then the reduced the effective, um, effective stresses and then once the effective stresses reduce the strength of the soil we know that it reduces and uh, so if you are able to somehow drain the water out uh, from the uh, from the pavement without uh, the water entering into the subgrade we can have a stronger subgrade and um, and a, a good uh, road surface for a very long time so let's look at uh, the different types of uh, uh, geosynthetic products once again I am listing the geotextiles first because uh, they were the first ones, uh, the first engineering products that were introduced into the civil engineering, geotextiles and uh, geo grids, uh, geo nets, geo membranes, prefabricated vertical drains, geosynthetic clay liners, uh, geo cells. The, all the previous products they are all planar products whereas geo cells they are three dimensional in nature, they have some uh, the surface area and some depth. And then of course there are several varieties of geo composites and geo others and so on. The uh, geo textiles is actually they are the first ones to be introduced into the engineering um, use, use along with the soils and these geo textiles these are um, engineered uh, sheet like products made of natural or synthetic materials and there are two types of materials like um, the uh, there is a woven product and a non-woven uh, product and uh, the woven product is uh, similar to the textiles that we wear like for example the shirt is uh, made of a woven um, textile and uh, similarly there are uh, some other uh, varieties which are known as um, non-woven products. One good example is the carpet, the carpet that we have in the houses it is uh, basically it is a, a number of fibers are woven together to form a thick um, a thick mat uh, like a carpet and some of the exam and the applications for the geotextiles are separation, the drainage, filtration, erosion control and, um, and also we can uh, use it as a reinforcement and nowadays uh, the geotextiles they are also made uh, with very high strength some of them as high as 700 kilo Newtons per meter that is a meter wide um, um, geotextile product can support a weight of 700 kilo newtons or 70 tons that is how strong uh, they could be and here you see the microscope photographs of a woven product, product and a non-woven uh, fabric. In the woven fabric we can see the weave pattern uh, clearly like um, the length and the width direction whereas the non-woven fabric uh, the fibers are randomly oriented and they do not have any preferential direction. Some pictures of the geotextiles are shown here. We could have a very thin uh, geotextiles which could be used as a, as a separator or as a filter and uh, we can also have thick uh, geotextiles. Some of these uh, thick geotextiles are as thick as 10 millimeters to even 15 millimeters and the thick geotextiles they are used for uh, drainage purpose like especially if you want the water uh, to flow away from the, uh, away from the pavement we can provide a very thick geotextile so that the water can flow along the, along the uh, thickness of the geotextile and uh, these uh, thick geotextiles they are also used as cushion especially when we construct uh, a landfill uh, with um, geo membranes. Geo membranes are nothing but plastic sheets and um, um, these landfills are to contain um, let us say some um, hazardous industrial waste or chemical waste and so on and we do not want this plastic um, uh, geo membrane to get punctured and so below that uh, geo membrane we may put a thick uh, geo textile so that there is some cushion. And here are um, the examples of uh, two coir products on the left hand side we see a woven um, coir mat, on the right hand side we have a non-woven coir mat and um, in the woven coir mat uh, there is a uh, we can see the weave pattern whereas in the non-woven coir mat all the fibers are randomly aligned so there is no preferential direction. 
and here we see an example of a woven uh, geotextile fabric. It's actually there are uh, different varieties of geotextile um, fabrics even uh, within the woven ones and here we can see all these, uh, these yarns uh, that are coming out and um, um, this has a definite uh, weave pattern length direction and transverse direction. And here uh, we see the application of a uh, geotextile below a railway track. These geotextiles they are excellent separators and also excellent uh, filter materials and uh, this particular um, track is in the Konkan railway and um, because of the heavy rainfall the tracks they used to sink into the ground because of the, the soft soil below the, below the track and because of the pumping action. When the trains go at a very high speed they develop lot of pore pressures and once the pore pressure builds up in the soil it comes out at a very high speed and when it comes out it brings along with it all the fine soil particles and if you if we line this uh, uh, soil surface with a geotextile um, it uh, not only provides some strength um, to the track but also uh, prevents all the fine soil particles from coming out of the ground and because of that we prevent the piping action. And in fact uh, after the use of uh, geotextile uh, the train speed could be increased in this particular section. In one particular season the trains they were run at a, at a very low speed of 10 to 20 kilometers per hour because of the problems of the track. But once uh, the stretch was reinforced the speed was uh, brought back to the, uh, to the original design speed of about uh, nearly 100 kilometers per hour. And uh, the next product uh, that is very popular the geosynthetic product is the geogrid. These geogrids they are also planar products but unlike the geotextiles they have very large openings. They have large uh, openings or apertures and these have excellent interlocking with the soil and aggregate and uh, typically they can um, be made um, with very high tensile strength and they are mainly used for, geo, uh, for um, reinforcement. Because of the open um, nature of these geogrids they cannot be used as a filter layer or as a, as a directly as a separator and they are mostly used as a reinforcement products um, below the pavements or below the railway tracks or um, for construction of um, a steep slopes and the high retaining walls and so on. And these geogrids they are of several varieties. They could be extruded the geogrids having very low strength like the Netlan India products that were made in the 80s and um, are stretched geogrids. One good example is the Tensar UK where uh, they pioneered the, uh, the polymer technology and uh, the manufacture of geogrids very high strength geogrids which are highly durable and these are made by a stretching product. So they are called as Tensar products basically these are all um, tensioned elements and um, more recently uh, uh, there are other varieties of um, geogrids made by knitting process or welding process and so on and um, there are um, in terms of the, the preferential strength directions uh, there are uh, uniaxial products which are um, used as reinforcement layers where we need reinforcement only in one direction like for example behind the retaining walls or behind uh, or for construction of uh, steep um, soil slopes. And the biaxial products, the biaxial products they have strength in um, almost equal strength in both the uh, predominant directions the longitudinal and transverse directions. And these um, uh, biaxial products they are used below the road bases or below the, the, below the railway tracks or uh, for general ground improvement also we use the biaxial products. And in this slide you see the manufacturing um, uh, procedure of um, the uniaxial products and the biaxial products. Basically um, in this stretching process what we do is uh, we take a plastic sheet, we punch some holes in it and then stretch them in one direction to produce uh, uniaxial grids or in two directions to produce biaxial geogrids 
and uh, in these patented processes where uh, the, the polymeric sheet is heated to some uh, temperature and stretched we orient the polymers in uh, preferential directions either in the one direction or in both the directions and once the, the, the polymers are oriented the strength becomes very high and most of these products they are also mixed with some stabilizers like carbon black and other things so that they can last uh, for a very long time. And um, these are uh, some examples of um, the different types of uh, geogrids. Here uh, we see on the top left hand side uh, we see an example of a uniaxial uh, geogrid, um, stretched uniaxial geogrid and here we see a composite of, a, of two materials a geotextile combined with a geogrid and uh, that can serve two different purposes one is reinforcement and the other is a separator as a filter layer and at the bottom we have the knitted uh, polyester geogrids uh, they are made by weaving process and uh, knitting process and um, here we see the application of a geogrid uh, for construction of, uh, of the, uh, the landfill at uh, Hindustan zinc factory in Vizag. And here we see the, uh, the uh, geogrid being applied for construction of a pavement and this particular um, product is a biaxial product because um, uh, the, uh, below the pavements the load is applied in all the directions. So we need strength in in um, both the directions. Um, so we have a biaxial product and now we have um, a new product that is just introduced in, into the market that is called as a triax which has strength in all the radial directions because um, uh, the, in these biaxial products there are only two preferential directions one is longitudinal and lateral whereas um, the load may be distributed in, um, in some other directions. And to take care of that type of situations, we have the triax grids which are just introduced into the market. And here uh, we see a very innovative application of um, very low strength um, uh, geo grids uh, for uh, coastal protection. And this particular application um, was at uh, Navi Mumbai. Um, near the Washi railway station. Here uh, because of the, uh, because of the, um, the, um, the ocean currents and then the tidal actions the, uh, the land um, was uh, subject to erosion and uh, most of the new Mumbai was uh, constructed by reclaiming the land from the sea and once you take something from the sea it would like to get it back and uh, slowly whatever um, islands that were constructed they, there was severe erosion and um, these uh, islands or uh, these uh, reclaimed lands they are lined with, um, with um, um, uh, what are known as uh, manufactured uh, geo cells made of uh, geogrids like this and uh, these geogrids they are uh, filled with stones um, in, the, in the portion that is uh, close to the water and then behind that um, all these pockets are filled with um, sand and the, and the result is that uh, the entire network is actually all these networks of um, the geo cells they are uh, knitted together by some process so that they are, the entire um, structure is one single unit and uh, we can um, um, easily control the action of, um, action of the sea to prevent the, uh, the, the sea erosion or uh, the coastal erosion and this is one of the early applications of uh, geosynthetics in India using very very low strength uh, uh, geogrids. So in this lecture we have uh, basically um, have tried to give a basic introduction to the topic of geosynthetics we have seen historical applications of the, the geosynthetics and then more recent applications and we have uh, discussed about uh, two varieties of um, geosynthetics that is the geotextiles and the geogrids. We have seen what they are and for what applications they can be employed and in the next lectures 
we will see uh, the other uh, geosynthetic products. Thank you.